Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this, this whole thing's called surrender. And uh, when I put this together, it was for the last youth retreat. And I didn't know what I was going to say. I just knew the topic was supposed to be surrender. And so uh, in preparation, I read a book, a really, really good book, uh, and it's called Surrender. Uh, it's by uh, Nancy Lee DeMoss. Yeah, she's actually Nancy DeMoss of Wagamuth now. Uh, writes some good stuff. I read this book. Uh, very good book. I have it on PDF now. If you want it, I can email it to you. Uh, highly recommend it. Uh, so I, I read it, and um, after reading through it and reading deeply into the scripture she referenced, I was very convicted thank God, as what I realized is this, that um, I, I was committed, I was committed to God, committed to Christ, to his church, uh, very committed, maybe, maybe overcommitted, you could say, because being committed, uh, you, can, you can be doing it in your own strength, uh, and that's what I was doing, and I almost burnt out. Uh, and I, what I realized, though, is that though I was committed, I was not surrendered. I was not fully surrendered. I realized that. I thought I, thought I was, but I realized what, what I was was not surrendered. Uh, it was committed. And uh, so that set me deep into all of this, which I hope to share with you in the hopes that we can get to where God wants us to be together. Because after, after reading her book, I was so convicted, that I'm like, wow, uh, not only am I not fully surrendered, but after I read that, I felt even to get there would be a challenge for me. And like all this time since I've been 26 years old, man, like I thought like, man, like I am as committed as you can get. And in some regards I was, um, but I realized like I was not fully surrendered. So we're going we're gonna to try to look at that. So I, I realized that the reason why, the, the, first, the first problem out of, out of a couple was deception. So sin deceives, and it deceives the whole world, and Satan deceives the whole world. But sin actually continues to deceive believers. And though we have the Holy Spirit who convicts us and guides us and leads us away from that, it can still be deceptive. So I'm going to read um, a couple passages. You can follow along. You can turn with me to a couple if you would like. You don't have to turn to them all. Um, but th these are all the things that deceive us. Uh, into a deception. The deception is, th the lie is, that if you give everything to God in full surrender, you will be losing something. Right? If you give God that which you like, your flesh likes, that you will be losing something, you'll be losing something that brings you happiness or joy. That's, that's the biggest lie of the universe, that there's something better than God. Uh, and that's, that's what sin does to deceive that's, that's the biggest lie in all the universe, that there's something uh, that competes with God in our souls. So there's a couple, couple deceptions. First one is our own hearts. Our own hearts deceive us. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? Right? Our, our sinful hearts, they, they have these desires, and these desires of the flesh, they, they deceive us. They lie to us. They say, uh, come pursue this, and it will give you fulfillment and satisfaction. Uh, that's, that's the lie that our hearts tell us. And the reason it's so deceitful is because our hearts, uh, they, they yearn for things. Like, they don't just like, have desires like our stomach gets a desire. Our hearts yearn for things. And those desires are so powerful that we think they're part of us. They think these desires, well, I desire this as part of who I am, part of my personality, because it's so inrooted in my heart. But that's the lie, because that's sin speaking not God. That's why Jeremiah says our hearts are deceitful above all things because those desires are powerful, potent. Uh, the next one I'm going to turn to is Hebrews 3, 12 through 13. Hebrews 12, uh, sorry, Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 13. And Hebrews 3, 12 thir through 13 says this, watch out brothers and sisters so that there won't be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage each other daily while it's still called today, so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. Encourage each other daily 
while I'm still called today, so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. Beginning that little passage there, he says, watch out, brothers and sisters. Paul's talking to believers here. He's talking to the church. He says, brothers and sisters, watch out. You have got to guard your heart against sin's deceitfulness. Sin's deceitfulness is out to deceive your heart. And if you allow it, your heart can become hardened in that area. And all the while, you can think you are committed to God while there's an area that's hard in your heart and you're in deception. And there's a part of you that's refusing to give itself over to God. So our own heart, sin. Uh, This is Ephesians 4.22. Ephesians 4.22 says, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Uh, Riches. Mark 4.19. Uh, Remember the parable of the seeds, the word of God being thrown out as seeds? And this one says, But the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches... And the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. The deceitfulness of riches. Uh, Romans uh, Romans 16, uh, 17 through 18. Uh, Sorry, give me one second. My uh, little position holder sunk in. There we are. Romans uh, 16. Verses 17 through 18. Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who create divisions and obstacles contrary to the teaching that you learned. Avoid them, because such people do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. So people, people deceive through smooth talk and flattering words. This is... This is, again, Paul talking to the brothers and sisters in the church. Watch out for those among you that would deceive you. Uh, and then uh, the last one is the devil. Revelation 12, 9 says, And the great dragon that was thrown down, the ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth. So we have sin, our, our desires, our own heart, Riches, people, and the devil, all trying to deceive us. All trying to deceive us. Now, the reason it's deceptive is because those things are desirable. If, if Satan came out and said, hey, come follow me because I'm going to steal, kill, and destroy you. Uh, come follow me. I'm going to kill you, destroy you, and steal from you. Uh, we're all going to be like, yeah, no thanks. Uh, not happening. But he deceives with sin and sins that our hearts desire because our hearts are deceptive and they desire those things. And so he puts those out there and deceives us with those desires. And the deception is so potent that says he deceives the whole world. He deceives the whole world. He doesn't say, come follow me and I'll kill you. He says, come follow me and I will satisfy you. Right? That's what he he tempted Jesus with. Bow down to me. I'll give you everything. Everything you've ever wanted. All yours, Jesus. You're hungry? Take care of that. You want power? I'll take care of that. All you got to do is bow down to me. And that, that's what he's continuing to do. And that's what we are up against. You see how much deception we are up against? We are in war. We, we are in a battle for our hearts and the affections of our hearts. Sin, the devil, is trying to steal the affections of our hearts that rightfully belong only to Jesus. And so that, that's what we're up against. Um, and it keeps us deceived, it keeps us enslaved. Um, and that deception tells us that if we, if we would surrender those things, that we will be joyless, that we will be giving up something that's a true desire of our heart. And, and who can do that? Who can say, take this true desire of their heart, say, no, this is my desire, I truly desire this. How can I give this up? And the lie that works so well is that, well, you can't. Because if you do, you will be joyless. Um, So Jesus uh, knows all this. And so he wrote us a word. And this word is the truth. And this truth sets us free. All right, so John 8, 32. 
Um, see if I marked that one. I'm not sure if I did. Yeah, I did. Okay, so uh, John 8, 32 through 36 says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So here's the thing with that verse, too, that I learned, that the truth of God indeed sets us free. It does. But there's, there's a, a, another part in that context that's important that I think I often miss. It says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So there's plenty of people who know what this says. They know what the truth says, but it does not set them free. Satan knows what this says, but he is not free. And there are many people whom he has deceived who, who knows, they, they know what this says, but they're enslaved and they are not free. Jesus says, if you abide in my word, then you are my, my disciples and my disciples will know the truth and that truth will set them free. Um, okay, so that's good. So there's a remedy to this. There's a remedy to this. We can be set free. We can be free from the deception, from the evil desires. We can be free to serve, follow Jesus. Um, here's, here's what trips people up, is that there's a cost. There's a cost to being a disciple. And so, therefore, there's a cost for the truth setting us free. Uh, so in Luke 14, verse 25 through 27... Luke 14, uh, 25 through 27, Jesus says this. Now great crowds were traveling with him, so he turned and said to them. So first thing, this is when Jesus is talking to these, these huge crowds. Huge crowds, monster crowds. Uh, and they're all following Jesus. They see him healing and, and turning uh, loaves into many loaves and doing all these awesome things. And so he turns to the big, giant crowd, and that crowd's about to get smaller. And here's what he says. Now great crowds were traveling with him, so he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And uh, <clears throat> that's where Jesus lines out, here's the difference, folks. Here's the difference to you, this, this great crowd. Um, you can... You can be committed to me, it's good, but I'm calling for more than that. I'm calling for full surrender. And so he turns to the big crowd and says, you want to follow me, it's going to cost you everything. You have to give it all up to be my disciple. All of it. And he doesn't hold back. I mean, this is hyperbole he's speaking here, but he's laying it out flat here. Uh, if you don't hate your own life in your pursuit of me, you can't be my disciple. That's what, that's what my disciples are. The people who have given up everything to come follow me. And so th this truth that will set you free, uh, indeed it will. Uh, but Jesus says, you've got to come follow me if this truth is going to do anything for you. If this truth is going to do anything for you, you've got to follow me. Um, so th the lie is that God alone will not satisfy you. God alone will not satisfy you. I think there's enough Christians who can believe that lie. They say, I'm committed to God because he's great, he died for me, and I, he saved me, and that's commitment. But even then, I think they can be deceived, saying, God is good, and I have peace, and you know, this is good, but I still need this. I still need, need this thing here. If I give that up, it will rob me of joy. And so I think um, there is a truth that, that sets us free from that. And the truth is that Jesus alone is everything. God alone is everything. Um, Matthew 13, 44, in one of his parables, says this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. In his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. Uh, he doesn't find it 
and see, oh man, if I to, to buy this, I got to get up everything. No, there was a man who did that. That was the rich man who desired the riches, the deceptiveness of riches. This man finds, finds the kingdom of heaven. He finds it. And in his joy sells everything. Just gets rid of it all. And the reason he's able to do that in his joy is because he beholds what he has found. He gets, he sees, he beholds and he treasures what he has found. He finds Jesus and beholds him and treasures and savors him. And in his joy, sells everything to obtain this, right? As Paul says, I count all things as rubbish that I may gain Christ. doesn't mean everything else is rubbish. God gives us lots of good things uh, as part of his good graces and, and gifts to us. Uh, but he, he considers those things total and utter rubbish that he may gain and know Christ. That's, those are the words of one who uh, beheld the treasure that is Christ. That's the truth. That is the truth that sets free from the deception. That Jesus is the treasure that our hearts, our desires yearn for. And he's so precious, so valuable, uh, that it, if, we, if we behold that, if we get that, if we see that, if our eyes of our hearts are open to that, then in our joy, just get Get rid of it all. Jesus, take, take it all. And that, that is surrender. And the lie is that in, in surrender, you will lose something. But the truth is that in surrender, you gain. Surrender is the way that you gain. The world says, no, you, you give up your desires. You're lying to yourself, betraying yourself, uh, not being true to yourself, with no inclination that uh, some of those desires could be deceptive. Some of those desires could be bad. Um, that's the lie. And the truth is that Jesus is the treasure that our hearts yearn for. And when we behold that, we joyfully receive it in forsaking all else. Um, surrender, then, if we're going to do that, if we're going to continually be in that place where Jesus is our, our treasure. He's, he's the treasure of my heart, my everything. Um, it's, it's both a one-time momentous occasion, like the man who finds the treasure in his field and in this moment just goes and sells everything, sells it all. It's both a moment, but for the believer, it's also a lifetime of surrender. And this is what I found out the hard way. I think at one point, at 26 years old, I, I did surrender. I did surrender. Then that surrender dwindled into mere commitment. And it left me spiritually dry and almost burnt out. Um, so I want to I talk about that too. So uh, surrender, it happens in a moment. Joshua, when, when the Israelites came to, to the promised land, they'd, they'd gone through the wilderness for 40 years, following uh, begrudgingly uh, God, finally comes to the promised land that's been uh, theirs as an inheritance, prophesied since uh, the beginning of God's relation with man. They come to the promised land. And after all that, Joshua, before they enter in, stops and says, Choose this day whom you will serve. Choose this day whom you will serve. If Yahweh, then serve him wholeheartedly. If these other filthy gods, then serve them. Uh, he says, you cannot have a commitment here and be mostly committed and have anything over here. You choose Yahweh or you choose this. That's it. And for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So it is indeed a one-time event that occurs. But also, it is a continual, lifelong uh, challenge, a battle that we have to wage. We have to wage that battle with God. With God. Uh, so let's go to Psalms 106. Psalms chapter 106. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 106. We're going to start in verse 8. 
and we're going to go through 14. Psalms 106, 8 through 14. Uh, so I'm going to read that. Um, I'm in the CSB. Sorry. <laughs> I'm in the CSB. There's an ongoing argument between me and Mike uh, as whether, you know, what, what's the better translation, the CSB or the ESV. And since he just left the building, I'm not switching to ESV. I'm just doing CSB. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> All right, well, I'll prove you wrong here in a little bit. All right, so uh, since Mike is back from changing the poopy diaper, I'm still using CSB. <laughs> so, this, uh, so this is Psalms 106, uh, starting in verse 8, going through verse 14. Yet he saved them for his name's sake, to make his power known. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it dried up. He led them through the depths as through a desert. He saved them from the power of the adversary. He redeemed them from the power of the enemy. Waters covered their foes. Not one of them remained. Then they believed his promises and sang his praise. They soon forgot his works and would not wait for his counsel. They were seized with craving in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. All right, so you guys catch that? God does all these amazing works of deliverance, freeing, uh, delivering his people from that which oppresses them. And they sing his praise. And the very next verse says, they soon forgot his works. And then what happens? They soon forgot his works and they were seized with craving in the wilderness. If God is not your ultimate desire, if he is not the desire of your heart, something else will replace that and it will seize you. That desire will seize you. If God is not what your heart yearns for, another desire will come and replace that and it will seize you. They were seized with craving in the wilderness. Remember, they wanted to go back to Egypt. They were headed towards the promised land through the desert. A challenge, yeah, a challenge, a battle, but worth it. But remember, they talked about all the soup back in Egypt had leeks and yummy things in it. So God, whom they were following, God did all these amazing things for them, and they forgot. They forgot what he had done. Then they remembered that craving. That craving seized them. So when, when, my, when my son was born, Liam, um, we were in the hospital, and uh, he, was, he was a big kid, uh, 99 percentile for head size. And so Ashley was, in, was pushing for four hours. And all that time, everything seems normal, and uh, heartbeat's okay. Nothing seems wrong. And, um, and so four hours and 17 minutes later of pushing, Liam is born. And apparently, in, in the delivery room, there's some secret button that the, the mom, uh, the, uh, the delivery nurse can hit. And they, she hits the secret button. Nothing happens until the baby is born. And so Liam, Liam is born. There he is. And all of a sudden, a SWAT team of nurses and doctors burst in the door. And they, they barge in. I don't remember how many it was, maybe 10 of them or so. And they barge in and they say, what's wrong? Did you call us? And the midwife says, yes, get over here right now. And so they barge in, go towards Liam. I just have to move out of the way. They cut the cord, put him on the table, and start trying to resuscitate him. And I had no idea anything was wrong. Well, I'm just kind of almost paralyzed with fear at this moment. Um, this, the SWAT team bursts in, they cut the cord, they start trying to resuscitate him. Uh, and I just started praying. I just started praying. And I have, no, I have no sense of time. I have no idea how long that time was. 30 seconds, five minutes, I don't know. Um, and eventually he just started breathing. And that was it. And we have no idea why. They, you know, their, their official diagnosis was he was a wimpy white kid. That was their official diagnosis. For some reason, white boys just struggle to live when they're born. They just struggle. Okay, all right, that's just how it is, okay. So in that time, uh, later we learned that um, Ashley's friend, in that moment, God, God spoke to her and said, one of them, of us three said, he said, one of them isn't with you. Like, one of them is not with us. 
and it was Liam. He, he wasn't there. And, and so she started praying. And we found out about this later. But uh, when, when it was all said and done, and I got to hold my son who's alive and my firstborn, uh, and, and the emotions kind of just settle, I can think clearly again. I, I remember walking, then walking out to the cafeteria and just praying, King Jesus, my life's all yours. All yours. You're my king, that's it. It's all yours. You have help, help yourself to my life. Have it all. Have it all. I remember praying that. And uh, that's kind of what happened there at, at that time, man. I was like, I was, I, maybe that was full surrender. And uh, I, was, I was, Jesus, my life's all yours. But then here's what happened in my life. I forgot the works that he had done. I forgot. And life comes in and it's hard. I'm in the desert, in the wilderness, and it's difficult, it's challenging, it's hot, it's humid, and you know, the, the, the desert of life, it's not easy. I start complaining, I start thinking about all the things that my flesh enjoyed before my, you know, this time. And, and I forgot about all that he had done. Like not only did he save me, and not only did he physically save my son, but I mean, all the immense blessings he's done for me, I just forgot. And my, my surrender then started to wane back down into just commitment. And what happened here was some of those old cravings came back. Uh, and now I, I, I had the Holy Spirit at this time, so uh, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't go into any kind of um, you know, sinful lifestyle. Um, but I, I found myself, where, whereas I had just given up everything wholeheartedly before and it seemed like there's, there's no battle whatsoever. Now it seemed like my flesh started craving things again. And, and though I didn't give in to them, my, my surrender, my full surrender to Christ, my desire for Christ started to compete with other desires. And surrender waned down into commitment and it was spiritually dry. Doing things in my own strength. Uh, I, I, for, up through this time, I, I almost burnt out. I was almost like, I need, I need a sabbatical. I just need to go away for six months. Uh, because surrender, giving all of yourself to God, gives you the fullness of life that Jesus talks about in the book of John. I give you life and life to the full. Commitment, um, it falls short of that. And though you can, you can be in church, and you can, um, you know, do, you know, play, play church and, and do ministry and all this stuff, that, that doesn't give you life and life to the full. It's good. Going to church is good. Reading the Bible is good. And serving God is good. But it does not give life and life to the full. Jesus gives life and life to the full. Jesus and Jesus alone. And so for a while there, I was, I was kind of lacking, lacking that. Uh, but, man, his word is good. Isn't it living and active? to pull, pull us out of those times uh, when we drift back into complacency or mere commitment and not surrender. So I want to warn you about that. Sin's deceitfulness is still out to get you. I, I surrendered. I said, Jesus, all yours. All yours. But Satan didn't stop at that time. He didn't go, ah, oh, lost one. There he goes. He surrendered. He goes another one in Camp Jesus. No, he didn't stop. He came back after me. He, he brought desires and deceitfulness and came, came after me again. He doesn't stop. That's why Paul calls us, guard your heart against the deceitfulness of sin. Guard your heart against that. Uh, if, if Jesus is not the full desire of your heart, something else will fight to be it. And then you may forget the works that God has done. And then you might be seized by cravings. And that is a bad, dangerous, and dry place to be. So, um, last thing I want to talk about is what, what, does, what does it mean then to be surrendered? What does it look like to be surrendered to God? For that, we're going to go to uh, Romans 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. 
Okay, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. So this one, I'm going to read the CSB and the ESV. Now that Mike really has left, I'm going to actually use the the ESV. (laughs) But first, here's the CSB. (laughs) All right, so this is Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Okay, now here's the ESV. Not doing it secondly for any particular reason. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I'm sorry, that's not not the ESV. Here's the ESV. I appeal to you, brothers, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, um, in the Old Testament sacrificial system, they would put a sacrifice on the altar, and they would, they would burn it up. That's called consecration. They'd burn the whole thing. If a, if a sacrifice was meant to be consecrated to the Lord, the whole thing goes up. You don't keep anything for yourself, nothing. The whole thing gets burnt up in a consecrated sacrifice. Here's what, here's what the Apostle Paul, here's what the Holy Spirit is calling us believers to do here. Therefore, brothers, so the therefore points backwards. Therefore, in view of the mercies of God. So the book of Romans talks about how we are all under God's wrath. We are all sinners under God's wrath, uh, deserving of condemnation. Uh, But God uh, demonstrated his love for this, that uh, while we were his enemies, while we hated him, he sent his son to die in our place, that we would not be under the wrath of God, but that we would be then under the mercy of God, being that the wrath of God was placed on Jesus in our place, that would not be placed on ourselves. And that in chapters six and seven, I think it is, that we still stumble. We're We're still gonna trip up, but the Holy Spirit is with us. He's gonna be with us in that time to get back where we need to be. He's gonna help us get there. And then it talks about Israel. You know, if this is all true, why is Israel falling short of it? And in chapter 11, he says, well, uh, because of your mercy uh, shown to you, they will be given mercy. Uh, And then he says, therefore, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So two things there. You You and I are to be living sacrifices, but we're to do it in view of God's mercy. This is the, this is the lie. The lie is, the world says, you give yourself to God, you're going to lose. And that, that would be true if we had to surrender because, uh, only because of his wrath. If it was only because of his wrath that we had to surrender, and if we, we had no other option, if we just had to surrender and just take what was coming to us, well, that would be true. But the truth is, we don't surrender in view of his wrath. We surrender in view of his mercy. And in that is not loss, it is gain. It is what uh, our souls were made for. So we, we, we are urged, Paul urges us, to be a living sacrifice in view of his mercy. Now, okay, I'm going to say this now because Mike's gone, but he's probably going to listen to it on the recording. This is where the CSB actually misses it just a little bit, and the ESV gets it right. Here's the word, the word there uh, where the CSB says, in view of his mercies of God, an actual better translation is the ESV, uh, by the mercies of God. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. We, we don't give ourselves up uh, in our own power and in our own strength. We do it by the mercies of God. Yeah, we do it in the, in the view of his mercy. We give ourselves up to him uh, and we receive mercy. And we do it because he's been merciful, and we do it by his mercy. It takes the, the mercy and the grace and the power of God to live this kind of life. 
this living sacrifice. Now, sacrifice, uh, whereas it used to mean loss, where you would, you would give something up, uh, and, this, and this sacrifice would be completely consumed, completely consumed on the altar. Um, now it means gain. Um, in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, the life I used to live, I put that to death. The life I now live, I live by the Son of God, by him living in me. Uh, and then he says in Philippians, to die is gain and to live is Christ. This sacrifice now, because Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice in my place, now anything I give up for God brings me gain. That's the truth. Against the deception that giving up will rob you. No, the truth is giving up will allow you uh, to, you will have gain. And so the living sacrifice. A sacrifice, now we talked about earlier, that surrender happens in a moment. It does, happens in a moment. And so that, that time, you know, when Joshua says, choose. Choose God or choose the others. Don't make half-hearted commitments to one or the other. Choose. And, and a sacrifice is kind of, that, kind of that picture. It all goes up, and they build, they build this whole altar, and they put oil on it. It goes up pretty quickly. A lot of fire, and it's just pff, gone. All God's. But we're not called to just be sacrifices. We're called to be living sacrifices. That means we live that way every day. We live that way on that altar where all of, all of ourselves is God's and God's alone. All goes to him. There's nothing left. And the thing about surrender is um, God does not make deals. He does, he does not make deals. He calls for the whole thing to be put on the altar and be burnt up, be all his. And uh, in commitment, we say, look, God, I, I'm, I'm pretty committed to you. Like, you can have everything but the right foot. Right foot's mine. I'm not putting that on the altar. Burn all the rest of it up to you. That part's mine. Can't have it. That's commitment. You, you can commit a lot of yourself to God. But that's not a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice is the whole thing put on the altar. And it doesn't mean you die. No, it means there's a new way of living. A new way of living. And that is a living sacrifice. And then there's a little bit more. I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. ESV says this is your spiritual worship. Sorry, Mike, CSB gets it a little bit better on that verse. Because the word there, I'm not sure why they translate it spiritual, but the word there is logic, logikos, where we get a word logical from. So he's saying, in view of God's mercy, uh, all the mercy that's been poured out on you, the wrath that has been absorbed by Jesus in your place, the logical thing to do from there is to give it all up to God. Every, every, everything. Every part of the body. All of it to God, none of it for yourself. That's the logical thing to do in view of his mercy. That's how crazy his mercy is. That's how unfathomable his mercy and love is. That's why the deception uh, deceives so many. Because what could be worth giving all of yourself up for something in full surrender? Commitment, sure, maybe. Full surrender, though, what could be worth that? The mercy and love of God. That's what's worth giving it all up on the altar to be completely, fully burnt up to him. Nothing left for myself. And then he says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Being conformed is being, being squeezed and molded from the outside in. It's, it's the world from the outside shaping you the way it wants you to be. Um, it's a passive thing. It happens to you. And in contrast to that is being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed. Again, passive. That happens from the inside out. The world wants to take you from, from the outside and conform you the way it wants you to be. That can happen if you're not a living sacrifice. That can happen. If, if the world can still get a part of you you didn't put on the altar, that can happen. And it'll conform you from the outside in. 
But if you are transformed by the renewing of your mind, happening from the inside out, well, then the world can't snag any of you. It's all on the altar. It's all been burnt up. And you can't get anything left because there's nothing left to give. And so what he's saying here is, give God everything. Give the world nothing. Give the world nothing. Give God everything. And that transformation happens in your mind. Um, 2 Corinthians uh, 3, 14 and 18. Paul tells us, uh, the veil has been removed. And we now all with unveiled faces can behold the glory of the Lord. That's what the guy who found the treasure in the field did. He was able to behold how great a treasure that Christ was. And Paul, Paul prays this. And he, he tells us like that, that's what we have to do. We have to have our minds open, the eyes of our minds to be open, to be able to behold the glory and the treasure that Jesus is. And with that unveiled face, beholding he who is our treasure. That's, we get that. A logical thing to do is to give it all up to him. Become a living sacrifice. That's the logical thing to do. ESV is also right too. It's also the spiritual thing to do. The spiritual worship. Um, but either way, it's the true, logical, spiritual worship to God. That's, that's what we were made for. We were made to worship him. And Romans 12 one says the, the reasonable, the logical act of worship is put yourself on that altar and set it ablaze all for him, not withholding anything from him, giving it all to him as a living sacrifice. Doesn't mean you're dead. It means you're living. It means you're living that way. Commitment can kind of look that way. It might have kind of looked like most of you was on the altar. And that's how I operated uh, for quite a while. And really, most of me was, was on it. Uh, and that nearly burnt me out. So I wasn't fully consecrated to God. Therefore, I was in disobedience to his word. And his word, living and active, cut right into the piece of the heart that needed to be cut and brought the change that needed to be changed. So I want to, I want to guard you, um, brothers and sisters. Be on guard against that deception, as it still is out to deceive us. Even if you've made that decision to surrender, Satan's not giving up on you. He's still coming to deceive you with sin and try to deceive you that there's a desire that has any, uh, has any holding to compete with our desire for God. Pray. Pray that the eyes of our minds would be open to behold the treasure that Jesus is. Truly the treasure that he is. That's a spiritual act. We in our flesh can't, can't comprehend that. We need the help of the Holy Spirit to open our minds and our hearts to behold how great a treasure he is. And from that, enjoy, in your joy, give it all up. In your joy, give it all up. If it's causing you pain to give it all up, it means you have a competing desire, a deceptive desire uh, that's still in your heart. And like the psalmist prayed um, in Psalms 119, Lord, incline my heart to you. Incline my heart to your word. This is battle. This is spiritual battle. And the enemy doesn't give up. And we have to pray against that. We have to. So that's, that's what I would leave you with. If you're fully surrendered, um, your battle hasn't stopped. Your battle has not stopped. Not if you are a living sacrifice, and living that way. If you're committed, uh, you have a competing desire. And you have got to take that to the Lord in prayer. Lord, incline my heart to you. And in that Psalms 119, he says, turn my heart away from worthless things. Incline my heart to you. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. And if you're not committed or surrendered, then sin and your heart and the enemy is deceiving you, telling you that there's desires out there better than God. And it's a lie. 
and it will never leave you completely satisfied. It will never leave you full. Uh, never give you that life and life to the full that Jesus offers freely to all people. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your mercy. Or we thank you for uh, your unending mercy over us, Father God. That though we were your enemies, Lord, that while we were your enemies, you sent your one and only son uh, to die a gruesome death in our place, the one we should have died. And Lord, um, we know that you did that. And still sometimes our hearts forget the works that you have done and crave other things. And Lord, we, we admit that. And we just pray for your grace and mercy and power over that, that you would incline our hearts towards you and away from worthless things. And that with unveiled faces, Lord, we would behold the treasure that you are, Lord, the treasure that our hearts so yearn for. Even if we ignore that desire, Lord, that is the desire of our hearts, desires of our souls, Lord. You place eternity on our hearts. We desire you and you alone. Lord, incline our hearts towards you and towards that. If there be any way in us, Lord, turn our eyes away from worthless things, that we would behold the treasure that you are, and in our joy, take it up. Lord, in our joy, take it up. And then give all of ourselves to you, Father God, that we may gain, that we may consider all other things as rubbish, that we may gain you. I pray that you would accomplish this in us, Lord, by your Spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Fight that battle every day. Pray. Pray through those desires. Pray that God would incline your heart to him. And in your joy, give yourself up to God. Amen. Dismissed. See you next week.